blood yet. I don't know if you like it. <laughs> uh, appreciate uh, even the invite. It's, a, it's an honor to be here. And um, actually, quite a few more people showed up than I even expected. So uh, during the middle of the week, I really appreciate that. Uh, we're gonna have some fun today. I, I know we have a wide range in our audience of, of education and background. I know we have some people coming in from the community, um, like professional coaches and, and other groups, some students, some faculty. Um, so I'll just sort of talk about some of the stuff we're doing, why we like it, um, and we'll go from there. And we'll kind of go back to the beginning here. We'll start in 1813, a gentleman by the name of Per Henrik Kling, and I hope no one in this room speaks Swedish. <laughs> my sweet, oh boy. <laughs> okay, <laughs> Trace. Um, in fact, you're going to help me then here in a second. Uh, but anyways, this gentleman was the uh, gymnastics coach in Sweden, and he sort of convinced the government to start a university called, how do I pronounce those words? Yeah, that <laughs> <laughs> Much better than I am. It's been a while for me, and I know like four words. Those aren't any of the four. Uh, but essentially what it is, and you can really highlight the middle word here, it was later translated and changed the name of the university into what's now been known as called G-I-H. Again, it stands for a bunch of Swedish words that I don't know, but it's sort of like the Swedish Sports Science Institute, but really what it was was it was the very first higher education university focused on physical education. At this time, they called all of it sort of gymnastics, hence the word gymnastics, and things like that. And they really only had a couple of focuses. They had a center for females, uh, which is gymnastics and females. They had a center for children, you can look at the push-up and plank positions. Look at, I imagine if our kids stood like that all day. Right, posture there. Um, and the same thing for men, they're all doing their side. I can't remember what that exercise is called. And then the, the fourth focus they had was in what they called physiotherapy. So it ended up sort of being what we now call physical therapy, or some, in fact, still call it physiotherapy. But this was really the focus of this entire institution, and it was the very first one really in the world to start studying the culture of what we now call kinesiology or exercise science or, or human movement sciences, or you know, every university has their own sort of terms. But it all started back at GIH. They got more and more advanced in, in terms of their understanding and information and, and their desire to know things, and so they started studying exercise, and they actually started to realize, wow, exercise is kind of a science. So now they started talking about exercise, not only in terms of I want to make you a better athlete, but apparently this is kind of complicated stuff. And so they started developing things like this old bike, and they could measure all kinds of different uh, exercise outputs. And they sort of changed the name of the institute to the translation as the Swedish School of Sport and Health Science. And this is really the blossoming of our entire field in terms of becoming a science. We move forward a few more years the Harvard Fatigue Lab, so America started to get involved and we developed things like that. Uh, does anyone know what these big bags are? I know the faculty, of course. <laughs> I, do you remember, did anyone else, did you use, ever use these? Yes. I have two, so don't feel old. No, George made us do. Right? Douglas bags. Those are Douglas bags. <laughs> and so the Harvard Fatigue Lab was really designed to start measuring this exercise stuff, but they were interested in things like industry. So how do we keep our workers safe? Um, Anyone else know sort of what was happening in the world between the 1927 and kind of ended around 1947? World War II, right? And so a lot of this was also driven by military. So how do we keep our military healthy? What's the base, basically what they wanted to know is what are the minimum requirements they have to have to survive? Right? And they had, in order to understand that stuff, we had to understand what's happening at all levels of physiology and all levels of exercise. From there, they started advancing, started realizing, if we want to know these answers, we can't just measure how much they're breathing. We have to start collecting blood. And we have to start essentially adapting a higher sophistication in terms of our measurement. And we have to actually make this a real science, and now we start talking about the term physiology of exercise, or of course what we now call exercise physiology. So as you hear all these terms as you're kind of floating around your career in whatever field you're in, this is why these terms exist, and this is sort of how they developed. We fast forward a little bit, or sort of move on to 1940, to one of my favorite 
characters ever, depending on how you like to pronounce his name. This is Dr. Karpovic, or Karpovich. If you don't know the story, I'm not going to tell you today, maybe in the Q&A we can talk about it. But I highly encourage you to just Google uh, the transformation of Dr. Karpovich. It's like a two-page little thing. It's really easy to read. But essentially what happens is, at this time, he was one of the world-renowned experts in physical education and exercise and things like that. And he was extremely against resistance exercise. In fact, you can see a quote there from him where sort of somebody asked him his goal, his career goal, and he said it was, quote, to fight these muscle builders. And he was constantly preaching for years and years about how it's bad for you, you don't want to overexert yourself, muscle-bound people, you lose flexibility, it's not healthy, it's bad for your heart, things like that. And without giving you sort of all the detail, he was given a demonstration by the folks at York Barbell, and they realized, ooh, maybe I'm wrong. And in fact, he finished his career with his career mission to support the exact opposite cause of showing, wow, there's actually a lot of health benefit to it. And it's a great story to read. But now we've sort of gone from not really understanding what's happening in terms of workload and military to start having more of a sport or recreation influence. And then this happened. <laughs> if you haven't seen this movie, you don't deserve to be in this field. <laughs> right? it, it's fabulous. I know they made a second one. It's not nearly as good. The original is awesome. But we're talking about now the 1970s. And if you don't know the movie I'm talking about here, it's essentially the what made Arnold a massive mega superstar. It's his story of winning his, I think, seventh Mr. Olympia in a row, or something like that. Point is, it launched this huge mega field of bodybuilding, which we're still fighting to this day. There's nothing wrong with bodybuilding. But everything in culture now, when we think of exercise, it's always aesthetic. And we have lost our appreciation for the connection between health human body, and performance. It's now the separation between health is over here, performance is over there, and these are separate things. And a lot of it's driven because of the backlash against all this bro science. What's also interesting though is this really drove people's ambition in terms of we thought, okay, not only is exercise okay, Dr. Karpovich said, okay, it's actually good for you. He transitioned. Now we started to realize we can actually make superheroes. Not only can we like be healthy and better, but with enough training, we can literally look like superheroes. And so we've got a huge shift in our culture and our appreciation for what's happening, because now we start to realize, man, I can make you look like that. I can make you Hercules. I can make you run a sub four minute mile. I can make you run a 26 mile race or a 100 mile race or whatever we recently done. Uh, a former mentor of mine was interested in the endurance aspect, and so he actually did a thing on um, Dr. Bagley and I were looking this morning. A colleague, uh, a couple of colleagues of his in 1975 did 83 muscle biopsies in one day. <laughs> Two of the people that biopsied, one was a guy named Frank Shorter, <laughs> who was one of the greatest distance runners of all time. Another of the biopsy is a gentleman that you all probably know named Steve Prefontaine. And what they found out is wow, these people that are running these elite marathon levels have these huge percentages of their muscle is what's called slow twitch muscle fibers. And then after that, basically, people popularize this idea that there's, hey, these fast twitch or these quick twitch muscle fibers, and then there's these slow twitch muscle fibers. And so we're now using this exercise physiology to support science, and we're starting to understand elite human performance. Right? And we're, we're gaining knowledge of physiology, we're gaining knowledge of how your body works, by studying these high level or high caliber athletes. Now this is actually the gentleman, um, uh, again I know the faculty probably know who Dave Costell is. Um, he's done a lot of the work with NASA and astronauts, what happens to your muscle when you're in space, and things like that. Um, he started one of the first human performance labs in our country. But what's really interesting about Dave is, is this is still about like 19, late 1970s, early 1980s. And I remember as a doctoral student, I asked Dr. Costell about sort of the development of exercise, and he told me a story that in the lab, it sat, and if you kind of look at probably that big building over there, that next big building past the tree line, 
At Ball State, there is a pond, like a little water fountain sort of thing, about that far away. And what he used to tell me is like in the late 70s, every Friday, him and the people in the lab would, would jog from here to that pond and back, which is what, like half a mile total? And he said people were like, oh my gosh, you guys are crazy. You're going to go all the way to the pond and back? <laughs> <laughs> He's like, yeah. <laughs> And it was this thing, and they do it like once a week, and that was all they do. And you know, there's still, we're, we're talking the 70s, and there were still ideas that, hey, you only have so many heartbeats in your life, don't waste them all. Yeah. Right? This is, like, this is not that long ago. This isn't the 1400s. This is <laughs> a couple of decades ago. Well, he did all this work, and he really started to shift the paradigm of, okay, exercise is over here, minimal exercise. And now, over 500,000 people finished the marathon in America last year. 500,000. And 30 years ago, they were crazy the once a week run to the pond and back. So what's happened? The culture has shifted, hasn't it? The expectations have shifted of what physical activity and performance can be. Now we've got people, and probably most of you, if you're, if you're a runner or any kind, 10, 15, 20 miles a week is, is nothing. In his time, four miles a week was crazy. And now that's one of the things we're trying to do when we study our elite athletes is to say we've, we've done a good job of shifting the minimal expectations of physical exercise, and it's better, but we don't feel like we're there yet. That it needs to get pushed even farther, that the normal physical activity, the ACSM guidelines, the minimum restrictions, we don't feel like they're there yet. And we don't think they're there yet because we don't know enough enough about these high-level performers. So that's why we're really interested in studying them. <laughs> like we should see these things, you know, uh, we'll talk about this all the time. <laughs> a friend of mine actually up here in the area kind of uses a term like, do you deserve to be a human or not? Mm -hmm. Right? Like, if you can't run 10 miles, you don't deserve to be a human. <laughs> if you can't do a deadlift with your body weight, you don't deserve to be a human. If you can't do some of these basic things, if you can't do a plank for 30 seconds, you know, deserve to be. Now, he's being a little harsh there, right? <laughs> but the point is sort of like, we shouldn't look at someone like this, like, you can run 10K? Wow. We should probably look more like, you can't run 10K? That's not healthy. Unless you've got a broken foot or something, you know, this, like normal healthy people should be able to have these baseline physical activity performance. We just feel like that. That standard, the minimum standard is a little bit low. We need to push the pace a little bit. I like this one too. It's the same idea, right? Like, wow, you're you're pretty physically fit. You must you must be on steroids, or you must be unhealthy. This one's my favorite one. Right? Just trying to shift that culture by understanding the higher end level form. So that brings us sort of, sort of our point uh, of my recent client, our point of our talk today a little bit, is we, we certainly appreciate the fact that we need to study the sick and the disease, and that, that probably needs to be the bulk of our research. But I think we just don't do enough of studying the elite. We don't know what the top end looks like yet. We don't know where we're supposed to get at yet, because we don't have enough information on that. So we like to study the elite. Some people will say there's sort of a paradigm or a, a continuum where you've got sick or disease, and there's normal, and you've got elite. Well, I actually personally disagree with this approach. In fact, what ends up happening is all we get is that. And so, and I'm, I'm just as guilty of this as every other researcher, not more. What we typically do in research is we'll say, okay, we want to understand um, type 2 diabetes or obesity, which is sick, right? That's what I'm using means sick. So we're going to take a group of diabetic patients and we'll compare them to recreationally or basically physically active, as if a normal physical activity level is healthy. And that's good, but we say, you know what? It looks like that. <laughs> You're just not sick yet. Right? And so what we're doing is we're saying, hey, we want you to get to here. And I say, no, no, no I want you here. you got to get there to get there. I, I get that. 
I want you here. Just not sick yet. It's the old adage of skinny is not healthy. Healthy is healthy. So as we sort of move forward now a little bit, you're seeing an increase in what I'll call sophistication. I don't, I don't mean importance by that word. I literally mean sophistication in the types of measurements. Uh, you see Dr. Bagley and the stuff he's brought, he's going to continue to bring in the lab uh, in their kinesiology department. But you get these words now, like these fancy titles, it's molecular exercise physiology. And, and basically what it is is you've got a bunch of, in my case, a strength coach is trying to play around with some chemistry. Poorly. So I, so I keep Dr. Bagley around because he's much better at it. And, and we get these fancy terms of molecular exercise physiology um, because we're trying to study this stuff at, at a little bit deeper of a level. And in fact, if we go all the way back to GIH, I had the opportunity a handful of years ago to go out to Sweden, to Stockholm, and work uh, in a pretty awesome study. So we went out there and collaborated with um, some pretty legendary Swedish researchers. That's a guy named Per Tesh. I don't know if you're familiar with the name. But essentially what we did is we said, all right, we want to take this whole body to gene approach. And the title of our talk today, phenotype to genotype, that's kind of what we're talking about. So all the way from the DNA level, all the way up to like the muscle performance level. So here's what we did. We looked at a group of elite 80 plus year old and older cross country skiers. So all these folks were at least 80 years old. They were all world champions at some point in their career to skiing. And they were all still competing. In fact, a couple of them um, had done a race called the Vasa Lopet. Did I pronounce that right? Close enough? Yeah, all right. It's like the Swedish version of the Boston Marathon. All right. It's on skis, but uh, an elite person, it's like the two hour mark. Most people are four to five hours, something like that. And several of our participants are on their 40th, 50th, or close to 60th consecutive year of running that race. So these were world champions in the 40s and 50s, and they were still competing. And so what we wanted to do is say, okay, let's take a look at these elite athletes. And let's look at them in the aging as well. And we did everything. We looked at this whole body to gene approach. So we did strength testing of their legs. We did VO2 maxes of them. We did MRIs of their quad. Um, we did cardiovascular measures, EKGs, ultrasounds of their carotid arteries. Um, we took muscle biopsies, looked at single fiber expression, looked at DNA, looked at fiber type. We tried to look at everything across the board, and we compared them to an age-matched group of non-athletes uh, in India. We published the paper um, in the Journal of Applied Physiology, and here's what we found. No, actually, this is good for some students in the room. What's a normal VO2 max number for a college age match? Somebody throws a number out there. It doesn't, you can't get this wrong. 40. 40. 40, 45, somewhere between 35, 40, 45. You would all agree? Somewhere in that area? Cool. Our group of 80 plus year olds had a group average of 38 and a half VO2 max. We actually broke what we claimed to be a world record. We had a 92 year old VO2 max of 42. <laughs> See what I'm talking about when you don't study elite? You get way down in your expectation levels, don't you? In fact, some of you, if you've ever done, if you were taking class with Dr. Lee or someone, and you had to do a VO2 max test, you make them do a VO2 max test in your class? In the lab, I think they did it today, actually. Oh, perfect. <laughs> <laughs> and you, I'm sorry, was it like, someone whoever just did it today? I think they're yeah. right now, actually. <laughs> but you hop off that treadmill, and, and Dr. Lee says, hey, you got a 45. And you're like, I feel pretty good. And I'm like, this 92-year-old? <laughs> you're getting chased down by a bear over time? You're probably getting to eat. <laughs> Research your expectations, doesn't it? That's all we're trying to do when we study our elite. We had a bunch of other really awesome stuff that we found from them as well. But just sort of highlight the idea of the fact this is the one I mentioned. He was a two-time gold medalist in 19, I think 48 and 52, maybe 48 and 44. We studied him again in 2009. By the way, check, see that little uh, snow cap he's wearing there? Apparently, in 2009, he had the same hairstyle. <laughs> 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 you're wearing your 
kid, your mom's always like, don't cross your eyes, it's going to get stuck that way. <laughs> Just don't wear your hat that way, your hair's going to get stuck that way. <laughs> <laughs> but pretty amazing, right? Um, so you can see Martin over here. Um, he came in one day, and we're in Stockholm in November or something. So it's pretty cold and snowy out there. And I'll never forget, he's walking across the street to the lab. And he's walking over, slips on some ice, and goes, Oh boy. And I was, we were all like, oh. <laughs> I swear, I can't make this up. He finishes his VO2 max test. And he doesn't speak English. So we're trying to give him instructions through a translator at maximal speed when he's yelling and screaming, go, 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 speak it, bro, speak it, bro, speak it, bro, or something like that. Right? <laughs> go, 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 go. And he's like, okay. And he like, keeps kind of like stopping because he doesn't know, like, the cardiologists are there because we're in a hospital. The cardiologists are like, he's got a heart rate of 170. Like, oh my gosh. Do your math, 220 minus 90. <laughs> and they are freaking out. Right? And we're like, go, go, go. And he's like, oh, go, go, go. We're like, yes, he stopped. Go, 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 go. And he finally finishes what we call it. He gets off and he sits down on this bench right here. He goes like, <sighs> I didn't really understand the test. Let me do that again. <laughs> and we were like, no, no, like, His expectations were just so much higher. Well, we look at the data here and you can see it, um, a pretty awesome figure that was generated from the study. This is your age, 20 to 100 up there, and this is a VO2 max number. And what this red line is, it's like a theoretical line of independence. In fact, some of these, your faculty here probably know better than I do about this number. But essentially what it is is the idea that if your VO2 max falls below this like 15 to 18, you're probably not living independently anymore. You probably need assistance living, things like, what's well, a normal VO2 max like walking around? Or the VO2, excuse me, of walking around pace. 15, something like that. So if your VO2 max is 18, you're not living by yourself probably. So here's what we found. The age match people, now these are independent living, healthy 80 year olds. So you're already winning, right? You're 80 and living at home still, that's a big win. But look at their numbers. What happens if this person right here gets sick one time? Gone. Rolls an ankle. Like one little tiny gets the flu. Any little bad thing happens, boom. What happens when they get sick? They're fine. You're going to bounce back. And so what we're really saying is push that pace as high as we can up here. It just gives you so much more margin of error when bad things do happen. It's going to happen. Just trying to keep you a little bit above that line. There's your 40, right, for normal person, somewhere in the mid-range, 30, 40, 50, something like that. In fact, um, that old guy was talking about the ramp of the pond, in fact, Dave Costello. He always basically said, you have no excuse as a young, healthy person to be under 60. 60 is pretty tough. <laughs> I've, been pretty, I've been there, but it's hard. But he was like, it's ridiculous to be and if you look at the literature, and I'll, I'll, I can give you the references in this later if you want, but not in healthy young men, but in, in the normal or aging populations, three really, really, really important predictors of mortality are VO2 max, leg strength, and lean body mass. And if you look at that list, and I didn't even tell you what we were talking about today, and I just said VO2 max, leg strength, lean body mass, and I said, what are these predictors of? You'd probably say, I don't know, best linebacker in the NFL. This looks like a list of athlete things, right? What I'm trying, the idea I'm trying to get you is being an athlete and being healthy is the same thing. Have you guys determined how trainable VO2 is? I know you're talking about that study. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll get there for sure. Oh, yeah, yeah. Get there after this. Um, yeah, it's, it's pretty trainable. Well, I'll give you numbers. So, my thought is, if these are the three things that are the most important, significant predictors of mortality, in other words, how long people live, when you're going to die, why not study people who are the best in the world at those things? Well, I, we'll probably save questions for it, but write it down. So, I work with a lot of uh, MMA fighters. And I have uh, the fortune, uh, I love the sport in particular, it's background, but I didn't really appreciate these folks until I started working with them. I started to realize and bring them into my lab that these are some of the fastest, strongest athletes I've ever had. At 
the same time, you have ultra high VO2 maxes. And I started thinking, like, how in the world is it physiologically possible to be on this end of the spectrum of strength, speed, and power, and on, still on this end of the spectrum of endurance? Because you're supposed to be, like, opposing fighting forces. And I didn't really believe it either until I continued to have them in my lab. This is one of my uh, athletes, Kai Lin. She fights um, in the UFC again on December 10th. Another one just fought Pat. He is a real prize. He comes in, if you know your lung capacity numbers, six foot one or so, about 225 pounds, and his lung capacity is like 8.2 liters, which is enormous. I'll give you some of his performance up later, but I started like wondering, like, my gosh, how is it physiologically possible to do these things that I pretty much tell you in my class, you can't have both of these. And at great endurance, you gotta be really strong or big, but you can't do them both. Apparently you can. So we bring them in, again, we like this whole body to gene approach. So I do a variety of performance tests. They're on the force plate, looking at rate of force development, max velocity, things like that. Vertical jump, spirometry testing. Uh, Wingate stuff, you name it. And we're trying to do all these classic things and figure out what's going on. But then we also want to put them on the knife a little bit. In fact, anyone in the room recognize that beautiful looking quadricep? <laughs> that's actually my, I think that's the first biopsy I ever did. Dr. Bagley was kind of enough to Don't make friends, that's what you say. It's one of those, uh, when you're a grad student, you get, um, you get asked to volunteer a lot. It's more like Jimmy. Where's your snake? He signed the waiver. So we take this approach, though, and we've done it. In fact, if you want to, um, some of the media stuff, Dr. Bagley, there's some videos um, of us doing some deep things. But in fact, that's Dr. Bagley again. But we want to take this up, that's the biopsy needle itself right there, you can see. And can you see, I don't know, the lighting, the, that little piece thing right there? That's the actual muscle tissue. And what we do is we go in, in fact, let me do this real quick, depending, you can watch this on whatever monitor you want. But this is a little video of what it looks like when we isolate the single muscle fibers. So all we literally do, in fact, Dr. Bagley has this in his office. You can see the bundle. That's the muscle tissue right there. It's dyed green, so you can see it. And that's all you do is you just go in with the tweezer, pull out a couple of muscle fibers. It's actually split, so there's one on the bottom there and one on the left. And then I'll clip it and cut it and see so you can sort of see it. But that's what he has like in his office. That camera and all that stuff. In fact, the setup that Dr. Bagley has is even better than the one we use for that. <laughs> My only video editing skills right there. I have one take, so I know how to edit it. Like, don't screw it up. <laughs> um, and, and, yeah, if you want to see more, you can watch the, I think the thing on Access TV we did for Inside MMA. Um, you can actually see one individual muscle fiber with your naked eye with tweezers on camera, on TV. So your muscle fibers are pretty big, actually. But that's the type of stuff we do. We want to combine all these things. We want to figure out a little more about performance. <coughs> Most people on this room are sort of aware that in terms of human muscle, all of your muscles are comprised of some percentage of it is the fast twitch and some percentage of it is the slow twitch, right? We don't have any muscles that's like entirely fast twitch or entirely slow twitch or anything like that, not the most part. They're all some sort of, comp some sort of composition. Well, it gets a little more complicated than fast twitch and slow twitch. In fact, it looks something like that. So we have three different types of fibers. This one are those slow twitch, right? Type one fibers. These are what we call your 2A, the fast ones. And then there's this fiber type called 2X. And these are like your ultra Lamborghini fast fibers. Actually, I kind of lied. It's a little more complicated than that still. What ends up happening is you've got fibers in between. Just like your car, that's half gas, half electric, it's called a hybrid, right? So you have single muscle fibers. This is one muscle fiber in your body that is partially fast twitch and partially slow twitch. 
you have some that are partially fast and partially like mega fast, then you actually have some that have all three components in one individual muscle fiber. And they can actually be anywhere in that continuum. And this is actually really critical. This is something that, that our work, uh, we're one of the few labs that can do it at this level of detail. And it's really important because we now know that anywhere between 10 and 70% of your muscle fibers are in that hybrid state. And depending on where you're at, most average people in this room are probably somewhere like 20%, 20, 30%. But we know, for example, like the sedentary, the more sedentary you get, the higher that percentage goes. And so what we think sort of happens, and this is basically a complete guess, so don't shoot me. But the more physically active you are, it doesn't even really matter what you're doing for your physical activity, the less hybrids you have, because what's probably happening is your, your fibers are specifying. So you need more power, oh, okay, we'll convert to be a faster twitch. You need more endurance, okay, we'll convert to be slow. Essentially, more volume you do, more slow twitch. Less volume, more fast twitch. But, then you stop training, you stop working out, because you get busy with life, and you get a kid, and you get a job, and you get extra classes, and you get night classes, and you stop being physically active, you gain these hybrids again. Essentially, your body says, you're not doing anything with me yet. I don't know what you want me to do, so I'm gonna kind of sit in the middle until you tell me what you want me to do. All right, we're playing neutral. So really, really important stuff. These hybrids, as I mentioned, these are sort of the fibers that are giving you most of your exercise induced adaptations. Now that's not to say your fast and slow aren't adapting, they totally are. But these are the ones that are kind of changing the most responsive to the different types of exercise. So, highlighting game time. All right, remember those two X Lamborghini things. A couple of labs have shown this now, and in fact in my lab, um, I think we have typed probably close to 2,500 individual fibers now. I think we found two, two X fibers. Less than about one in every 1,000 fibers are pure genetics. We almost never find them. This is looking at old, young, shoulder, quad, gas rock, endurance trained, non-endurance trained, lifting trained, sprint trained, you name it, and we almost never find this hybrid or never find these two X fibers. Right, so we find a ton of 2A, but we don't find the Lamborghini ones, the negative half. So if we looked at most people, most people would have a fiber type profile of probably something like that. Again, if you add up all those hybrids, it's probably something like 20 to 30 percent. Most of your 30 to 40 to 50 percent are the slow type, and then some percentage being fast. Well, this is actually a project um, I got to do as a doctoral student. But we took a look at, let's see if this will work, this gentleman. This is actually just published in the Journal of Applied Physiology. This is here, right? So I believe that world record still stands. Um, at his time in his career, he had two separate, he had the, also the 60 meter world record or something like that. Those details might be a little off, it doesn't matter. But they, uh, Scott Trappier, former advisor, did this project, took a biopsy of him. And there was nothing actually particularly special. Didn't have a lot of our fast or slow twitch, but that was sort of to be expected. Didn't really have that many two ways. But he had that. Okay, uh, <laughs> this was actually repeated like four times because they were like, no way. Like, no. <laughs> <laughs> over and over again. And it took them eight years to publish it, something like that, took forever. 24% pure 2x. We can't find any normal healthy person at all with more than like 1 or 2%. I don't know if you've ever seen him with more than 3% maybe, something like that. And he's rocking 24%. What happens when you study elite? 
Things are different. Right? Things are completely different. It's sort of funny because I'm like, he literally, literally is an X man. <laughs> Come on, laugh really loud from the camera. <laughs> hey. I don't know what this means. I have no idea. I know they have no idea. It's never been found again. Um, maybe Usain Bolt's got the same thing going on. Maybe not. No idea. Maybe there was an error. Who knows? My point is, we would have no idea if we go on to these to try to study these elite. Who knows? Maybe every high-end sprinter has that. Maybe this was a mistake somehow. I don't know. Have you looked at its parents? I don't, I don't think so. In fact, there's a BBC documentary on it that you can watch on the whole thing. And you can see him, like, at the end, they're like, before he finds out his results, they're like, would you rather it be like you were born with this or that you, like, worked into this? And he was like, oh, I hope this is, like, born. <laughs> like, you want to be born like a superstar. So we we'll go back to, anyways, uh, go back to this guy I talked about. I really to. He had all these amazing performances. If you ever watched him fight, um, he basically doesn't get tired, which is pretty neat for a 230-pound man. Um, conditioning is phenomenal. I mentioned his lung capacity. Strength numbers off the charts. Uh, hand grip diameter like 87. Just crushing. Right. He's an amazing, amazing animal. <laughs> Anyone, uh, Dr. Lee, do you happen to do Wingates in that class too? No. All right, so what would you say if you saw someone with a uh, peak wattage of 1,000 in the Wingate? Great, good, amazing. It, it, it's a pretty good, right? But you're not like blown, your doors aren't blown away with a thousand watts of wind gate. Relative, actually, that's pretty good, but relative wind gate peak power is not amazingly high, 10 and a half. But we actually had to do this wind gate five times in a row. It's got about a minute rest in between, and he had a 20% drop in power over five repeat wind gates. I'll say that again, only a 20% drop in power. Most people can't finish this one, and you're done. I, I don't know another athlete that can do that. I've never seen one come close. So Dr. Bagley had the idea, let's fiber type him. And here's what we find, almost 70% to A. This is an endurance athlete, for the most part. He's a high-level uh, mountain biker, too, in his off time of getting punched in the face. <laughs> Really, really high percentage. If I showed you this graph, you, you'd probably say, oh man, he probably jumps really high, probably strong, but he probably gets tired immediately. He doesn't. One of the most highly conditioned athletes I've ever been around in my life. In general, when we look at the fiber types, the fast, the slow, and the 2x, they're actually all about the same size in terms of their diameter. So a lot of people think, well, the big, faster fibers are bigger. Not necessarily true, but when we look at people within a training spectrum, the high level distance runner, in fact, we may see this tomorrow, their slow ones might be a lot bigger. We looked at someone who's compared to a strong man, their fast ones might be bigger. My point is, your training background matters. We're not all the same. And, and things that we don't think happen are probably happening. In general, if we look at the power output though, look how much of an advantage Colin Jackson had with those 24% 2x fibers. Now we start to understand, this is why you can run a 12 second 100 meter hurdles. And I can run like a 21, <laughs> or whatever we're all at. I have no idea. But we're, we're still, my point is, we're still learning a lot about this stuff. We really don't understand performance. We have no idea what's happening at this level. We got a pretty good idea what a normal college recreational male looks like. We got a pretty good idea what like a recreational cyclist and a recreational runner looks like. But the anaerobic sports, we know almost nothing. We know almost nothing about the elite at any sport. We had a lot of good information in the 70s about elite marathoners, but with our advances now in technology, we basically got to redo it all. Uh, you should all know this word, right? Hyperplasia. Right, if you're in, again, one of our advanced muscle classes, we should definitely know this word, right? Hyperplasia basically is an idea of when your muscle gets bigger, you get bigger by adding more muscle fiber. Well, generally, we're going to tell you that that doesn't happen in humans, right? Generally, hyper, our hypertrophy is explained by each individual fiber just getting bigger. You don't grow new muscle fibers. But when we take a look at our last gentleman's fibers, 
they're particularly small. Even his two A's are particularly small. How are you 225 pounds of rock solid muscle with tiny individual fibers? What do you have to have? A lot more. I'm not saying he doesn't, Dr. Bagg has got some more work to do to answer that question. He's spending too much time doing work up here. <laughs> not doing enough time with our science. Let's give him a couple of course releases, extra salary. <laughs> <laughs> right. But when we're starting to uncover some pretty unique ideas. We do know that elite level bodybuilders have been shown to have many, many, many more muscle fibers. We don't know if that's hyperplasia or if they were born with it. But we're not going to know unless we study it. <clears throat> unless we start to figure it out. This is another friend of mine, AJ Roberts. <clears throat> AJ is world record holder in multiple things. That's AJ, uh, 308 pounds, doing a 1,205 pound squat. He bench pressed over 900 and squatted over 900. About 5'9. 308 pounds or so. No one of his strength caliber, even remotely, has ever been fiber typed. Maybe he has 24% 2x. I don't know. We're going to find out soon if I have seen him. <laughs> Maybe he's got something else entirely going on. Maybe it's all neural. Maybe it's all connected tissue. Maybe it's a combination. I have no idea. Maybe he's got a new type of fiber we don't know about. That's probably not true. But I don't know. What is we don't know? Maybe he just simply has. Like bodybuilders, way more muscle fibers. Maybe he grew them through hyperplasia through his years of training and his admitted years of anabolic steroid use. <laughs> but I don't care. Take all steroids you want, just about 1,200 pounds. I'm impressed. I can't roll 1,200 on a ball. I can't push my 1,200 pound car. It's lots of that. So, another kind of idea is bigger always means stronger. Well, we know that's not always the case, but now we're trying to figure out why. So, one of the things we're looking at is we know like the fiber, the power, or the contractile nature of your fiber types can change. The fast ones can get faster and stronger. The slow ones can get faster and stronger. And it's not completely uncommon to see a slow twitch fiber that is stronger and more powerful than a fast twitch. Now, it's not totally common, right? But you wouldn't be completely freaked out if you saw that. You would expect it, but you wouldn't be completely freaked out. So we don't really know what's going on at these because we're not studying these highly strong, highly fast, highly powerful athletes to really understand them. And now we sort of enter Dr. Bagley's really, uh, his, his expertise area. And I like this question of, why do some people respond better to training than others do? We all know that person, right? Like you do the same workout as them, you eat the same thing, like two weeks later they're huge, and you like haven't gained anything, and two months later they're huge and there's six packs there and you're like, I lost a pound. <laughs> <laughs> well, we actually have some indication of that what we face happening. If we look at an individual muscle cell, we know that you've got, if you imagine that little brown thing as the nucleus, that holds your DNA, that controls your fibers, tells it to grow, shrink, die, repair, things like that. Well, we know when you do certain types of workouts, you activate things called signaling proteins. Those proteins activate other proteins, and they basically transfer a signal to your nucleus. That nucleus decides to replicate your DNA or not, or how it wants to do it, or whatever it's going to do. And then you go through that process of protein synthesis. Right? And then you went from that to that, right? Well, what we now know is some people have more or more sensitive of these signaling proteins. Some people respond, have a higher hyper response at the nucleus level to the same stimulus. And we actually know that, for example, if you did three sets of 15 or 15 sets of three, you get different signaling protein activity. Which is weird because you think about it, all in unprincipled, right? You get 45 maximal single fiber contractions, right? The fiber can't contract like three quarters. So how is it 45 maximal contractions happen when you get totally different responses? We're starting to figure out why at the, at the individual level. In fact, there are some companies now where you can get some of this testing done on your own. It's only a couple hundred bucks. We're going to get there. We're going to have, soon we're going to have these big centralized databases of things like this. It's going to be really easy to figure out these questions. 
The last one here, I love this question. We all know this is true, right? So why is it easier to get back into shape than to get into shape the first time? We all know that happens, right? Why is it? Well, it's our basic train detrain model. So Dr. Bagley wrote an awesome article about this um, on a barbell shrug podcast or on our website. But basically, same idea, right? If you're a trained athlete and you become untrained, you're still going to get retrained faster than an untrained person takes to get them trained, right? You, you, you get the idea I'm talking about here, right? Well, one of the current thoughts behind this, and we don't know that this is totally the answer, but one of the thoughts is this idea of nuclear domain. So take a look at that far left circle. Okay, imagine that's one muscle fiber. And you should remember from your undergrad class that each of your muscle fibers is multi-nuclear. Like a thousands of nuclei per cell. So in this particular case, this picture you have four. So we can actually calculate the amount of area or the domain each individual nucleus is controlling. Okay, think of it this way. Uh, you will, we're in San Francisco, key of a startup, right? We're a tech startup, okay? We open up a new company. You start the company starts to get bigger and bigger and bigger and you, and you want to expand. You want to expand to other countries and other states. You probably need to open up another like branch in Singapore. And you probably need to open up one in New York. You probably need to open up one because when things go bad, it's too hard to control. So the bigger you get, the more control centers you need, right? This is a pretty understandable concept. So what we the initial idea here is as you get bigger. Your ability to get bigger is regulated or controlled by how many nuclei you have. You're not going to open up a branch if you don't have anyone to power it, to control it. And so you'd have the same hypertrophy and it looks something like that. And so what the thought process is on train, detrain, retrain is you, were, you started off there and you were big and swole, but then you stopped working out and you shrunk, right? Well, the thought was all those extra nuclei you had you get rid of it. So you expand, you have this huge empire, and you decide, you know what? We're going to lay people off. You're going to close down branches in New York and Chicago. Well, you're not going to keep your managers around. You're going to keep all your employees around. You close down a branch, you close down the control center, too. And then you go back to work out, and you have to go back through that whole process again. But one of the thoughts now is, these stay around. So even though you close down your, your New York branch, you keep your manager on payroll. So that way when you decide to open up the branch again, happens right there. Boom, so fast, it happens again. Now, this is, we don't know this, this is not a fact, this isn't proven yet, this is kind of a working hypothesis. Pretty good, pretty good data on it? Good animal data for sure. Good animal data on it, working on the human data. Might be wrong eventually, but that's the sort of idea. And so now we actually know things like <coughs> your slow twitch fiber, those have more nuclei than your fast twitch fiber. We know that the, the amount of satellite cells contained in the slow twitch are more. And the amount of nuclear domain space, or the amount of area each nuclei is controlling, is smaller than the slow twitch. Okay? And so what we actually do, um, and this is a video that the, he made last summer. This is a 3D rendering of a single muscle fiber. So what you're looking at here is basically a fiber put under a, a, a microscope. And you shoot the laser kind of in a bunch of different gradients and you can actually make a 3D rotating movie of a single muscle fiber. And the red stuff there is the active that's been staying. Right? <laughs> and the blue things, those are the nuclei. And so we not only can we count how many nuclei you have, but we can figure out exactly what portion of your cell they're in. <clears throat> so we now know things, for example, we, the, the thought is when the nuclei start going to the middle of the cell, the fiber is about to die. We also know that when they are organized in certain spaces, when they change their shape, that changes how the cell is regulated and controlled. I can't tell you much else about this uh, because it's pretty, pretty new. This is actually a still image um, of that same thing. It's a 3D rendering. And you can look at it again, how many nuclei you have. You see how some of them are like really circular, but some of them are elongated? That all means something. 
Potentially, some of them are being caught, being moved throughout the cell, being drug along by some proteins, maybe not, I'm not really sure. Again, he can do the expert on this. But the point is, we can do stuff like that. So it's actually a paper that we just published where we 3D printed those muscle fibers. So I literally took that file that I just showed you, that movie, I put it on the flash drive, we walked to my library at Fullerton, I walked to the printing thing, and I said, we have a 3D printer, right? And they're like, yeah. And then I said, what, what kind of file do you use? And they told us, and I was like, that's the same file we have in here. Can we print this? And it was like, yeah, come back tomorrow. <laughs> and so we can 3D print muscle fibers. We had to use some shoe polish to, to color the new way. <laughs> or something, some fingernail polish, I mean. But that's what it looks like. Um, so, awesome stuff there. So, I guess if you if you want, for $10,000, you can come down and buy them you and purchase one of your own fibers. <laughs> Maybe 100 of them. Depends on student on So, we go back to our guy here, and we knew his fiber type was really, really, really fast, but what we looked at is that mononuclear domain. Now, the gray bar is a normal range. So again, a big number here means each nuclei controls a lot of area. He's not even on the list. He's so far down, he's so far low, he didn't even make the normal chart. Now this is a bit preliminary data, we've got a lot more work to do on this. But the point is, having his mononuclear domain space to be so low, that means he's got a whole lot of nuclei packed into his fibers. Now, Training-wise, what's that mean? He recovers really quickly. Those five repeated wind gates we had him do, the next day, in fact, that afternoon he trained again. He usually gets like an off week is 12, 14 training sessions a week. A lot of those involve full contact sparring, um, a lot of mountain, like a lot of heavy lifting, things like that, because Maybe, anyways, I should say, maybe because he's got so many nuclei, he can respond and, and recover so I mean, it's a guess, total speculation, but it's really interesting. I have another UFC fighter who is fighter who has probably even better conditioning than the last guy. He's <coughs> even more powerful, but way smaller. He's 145 pounders. Walks around like 175, competes at 145. <laughs> we got interested in him. Or, or he sparked my interest in, in things like mitochondria. So what you're actually seeing here is a preliminary thing. Instead of it being red now, you can see the mononuclear there. All that green stuff is mitochondria. So it's kind of a janky little photo. We've got to work it out a little bit better. In fact, it looks a little bit different. So if you go back, you take that fiber, zoom in on an area. Looks like that, zoomed in on that area. Now the mitochondria are tagged in green, or in red. Each one of those dots is a mitochondria. And so now we can start counting the mitochondria in the fiber. And look how organized they are. It's not an accident. Right, so now we're starting to explore, trying to get that to work. And we, we worked pretty hard the last summer. And we didn't get a really great image. But there's one of them. So what you're seeing here now is all three combined. So red, all the red, going that way is actin. All the green going this way is mitochondria, and then you have your mononuclei right there. And so what we're trying to do is be able to capture all three in 3D on the same muscle fiber. And then of course we try to type it too. That's kind of what we're getting to. We haven't quite got, yet, got there yet. Hopefully over Christmas we'll get figured out. Probably not though. <laughs> Just a couple weeks. <laughs> You keep buying stuff and it keeps not working, but it gives you some interesting <laughs> feedback and we'll get some stuff. And we can't, we can't ignore this question, we're going to have it, um, is nature versus nurture? How much of this of these athletes just born with and how much of it do they train? Well, I don't know. We have some speculation of the trainability of some variables, but one of the things that we're doing is, um, in fact, again, this is Dr. Bagley's fault. Uh, this is one of my grad students, Katie. Um, she was with Jimmy one day and uh, they were talking and she just happened to mention that she has monozygous uh, parents. So her dad has a monozygous brother, a twin, the exact same DNA. Her dad, dad, dad's dad, her dad has been doing 
marathons, Ironmans for like 30 years. Her uncle basically has never exercised. We have literally a cloned human being. We have a 30 year training study on a clone. Because they have the exact same DNA. And so we're actually working on a study right now, in fact, um, December 18th, 19th, and 20th. They come into town and we're doing this whole thing again like we did with the old Swedish people. And we're doing it on them. And we're going to see. We know all these things are basically trainable. Almost everything in your body is trainable. What we want to know is how much. 20%, 30%, 50%. How much of the DNA stuff is determined by birth? Does one have more mitochondria, nuclei than the other? Things like that. How much of the fiber type changes? How much do you get that? So that's some of the stuff we're working on. Um, I know I sort of talked about a lot there, and I'll kind of end on this right here, going back to our original point. I love this saying by a guy named Bill Bowerman, a famous track and field coach. But he basically said, if you have a body, you're an athlete. Right? I'm not interested in athletics, I'm not interested in performance. Are you interested in health? Then you better be. If you got a body, you're an athlete. <coughs> so we just like to take the approach. We're in the same game as everyone else. We want to improve the human condition. Um, we just take a little bit of a different philosophy. So that being said, I want to thank Dr. Pat. <laughs> <laughs>